Welcome to the online ministry of Faith Christian Fellowship. FCF is a dynamic word and spirit empowered church where faith and family meet. If you would like more information about our church or other media resources, please visit us at faithchristianfellowship.com. We hope you enjoy this message. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. All right. And tonight, I'm wanting to just share something with you that I've been kind of getting a little bit of a download ever since we started, really started this year. And we, in the back, we've been talking about connecting you know we've been going over starting about our values and 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 our vision here at this church and we've been talking about connecting connecting with God connecting with each other I'm kind of wanting to kind of transition and 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 stay in that tonight God has been showing me um, some awesome things go ahead and turn to Psalm 63 because that's where we're going to be living at tonight is in Psalm 63. If I had to ask you, or if I asked you, one thing in this world that we all have to deal with, every single one of us, that we have to deal with, just think in your mind for about five seconds that we all have to deal with in this world. When I want to talk tonight is about pressures. And how this world puts pressure on us. How the enemy comes to pressure us. And I wanted to talk what we're going to do and what we can do with these pressures. And we're going to look at one of, one of my main men in the Bible. We're going to look at David and see how David faced his pressures. And what he did in the face of it. Now I want it real quick want to define pressure for you, and it's the use of persuasion, influence, intimidation to make someone do something. We all deal with pressure. It starts very, very young. At the age of five, when we start kindergarten, start school, we have pressure. We're pressured to make straight A's. We're pressured to compete for the best grades possible. It builds up when we start getting into athletics or whatever other clubs, we're pressured to excel. We're expected, there is pressure on us to excel and be the greatest that we can be. Push us, pushing us beyond our boundaries. From there, the pressure of high school, our friends, our families that put pressure on us, the pressure to even graduate, and then pressure getting into college. What college do I go to? What do I major in? Is this the right way? Is this God? Is this where you want me to go? Major pressure. And then graduating college. And then the pressure of finding a job, a good job, that will give me enough money, that will pay enough to where I can take care of myself and do everything else that I'm called to do. And then the pressure, build it keeps building. The pressure to find the right mate, the right spouse, and then the pressure to, to grow and to work on that marriage. And then kids come along. And then the pressure to raise godly children, to be a godly parent. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, that's some pressure right there. And just I mean, constantly, guys, throughout our entire lives, we see pressure pushing on us in our lives. We have so many problems. There's world, economic, personal, other people problems that are pressured on us. Just You can see it all around us. But what I want to talk about is what will determine the course of our life. That will determine how we can look at these pressures in the face and give it to Matumbo finger wave. <laughs> Not in here. Not in here. Your priorities. Where, what are your priorities? Let me define priorities real quick. Something more important than another. Everyone has their own priorities. You set them yourself. 
It is your responsibility. It's up to you to set your own priorities. What is important to you in your life? What is the most important? What is more important to you? Your priorities. So your priorities are going to steer you in life. They're going to tell, they're going to, it's kind of like a boat. You're going to steer in your life. Now you have two choices. And I want you to think about yourself right now. Do you know what your priorities are in life? Do you truly know what they are? Because when they, you don't have clear priorities, these pressures in life is just going to sweep you downstream, wherever it wants to take you, tossing you, turning you, wherever. If you have clear priorities, you have direction in your life. If you know what matters in your life and what you love and what is important to you in your, in your life, you have clear direction to your destination, whatever it is. We'll get to the spiritual aspect here in a bit. I just want to lay this foundation right now. I want you to get thinking in your head about priorities and about pressures right now. It's crucial to have the right priorities. Look at Matthew 6.34. Talking about priorities here. Give your entire attention. This is all, everything tonight is from the message. I love, love, love. The, the message translation. Matthew 6.34 says, Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. Don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. Priorities. Is tomorrow a priority to you? Or is right now? How big of a priority? How important is right now to you? Are you thinking about tomorrow? Are you worrying about school tomorrow? What's going to happen? Are you worried about work tomorrow? Are you focused right now? Is your priority right here, right now, on the Father? What is important to you right now? I want you, your minds, I want you all to get focused right now. Set your priority on the right now. Because it says right there, give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. Right now. What is He doing in your life? What is He telling you right now? What is He speaking to you right now? What did He speak to you in worship? Priorities. Don't give any attention to anything else. Priorities determine how you are going to spend your time and who you are going to spend your time with. It's so important to have the right priorities. Priorities determine how you make decisions. Whoever, whatever is important to you guys, that's where your time's going to be. That's where it's going to be. Whatever's pressuring you, there's many things that can pressure you to where your priority, your time, your time is so valuable. So valuable. That was one of the biggest, biggest things I learned when I got into college was my time management and how time is a priority. Because I only have 24 hours in a day, and it goes by like that. So your priorities, guys, your time, who are you spending it with? How much of that time are you spending with the Father? How much of that time? Is this the only time that you ever get in front of him? I mean, I hate that tonight I'm, I might step on a little toes because God has been on my toes the past couple months now since he's been showing me and just teaching me on this. It's so good. So it's not, it's not, I love you all, I want you to know that first and foremost before we get too deep. Now I want to get into, into the meat of it. David, my man David, he knew all about pressures. All about pressures. The king of the Israel, king. Talk about pressures on that. How much pressure there is to be the leader, to be the king. The higher you go up in the food chain, food chain the more responsibility and the more pressures you have. A lot more. 
So just imagine how much pressure he was under being king. He had so many problems going on. At this time in his life, his son, Ablissam, was leading a rebellion against him. His own son. His own son leading a rebellion against him at this time. The pressure of his own son turning on him. So at this time, David and his loyal followers are fleeing into the wilderness of Judah. And he felt disgraced, rejected, with an uncertain future. And this is when he wrote Psalm 63 that we're going to look at tonight. Keep this in your mind. The pressures that is on him right now. He's not in his beautiful, comfortable palace. He's not with his wife. He's not in his comfortable surroundings with all the food and the drink, just the comfortable. His own son is wanting to kill him, is after him. And then his own followers that are coming with him, the pressure of trying to keep them safe and to keep them fed, keep them safe. Imagine, so just think and remember this in Psalm 63. Let me get there real quick. Psalm 63, guys, shows us the priority of David. Because when you're under pressure, your true priorities come out. <coughs> when life is pressuring you, when you are just under intense pressure, then we'll see where you're true. What are your true priorities? What is the most important to you? And we're going to see it right here. Prime example. What is David's priority when all hell has broken loose on his life? Not one single thing is going right for him. Everything is in mad chaos. What is his priority? What is important to him? So let's get into it. Seeking God should be our most important priority. Let me back up real quick. Think about what that, what's happening to David. How would you react to all this? How would you react if you are kicked out of your house, you're in the wilderness, desert, no food, no drink, you got a crazy guy coming after you, wanting, to, wanting your life, you have no security, no safety, this, you have no idea what's going to happen. How would you react? Would you write a song? Would you write a song? Would you be praising God? Oh God, how much I love you. Thank you. Would you be thanking him? Would that be your priority? I am just want to ask the questions. Because David, right here in his life, he expresses longing. He wants and needs God's presence. He expresses his longing for God's praise his joy and fellowship with God. He seeks after him. The word seek, if you look at, look at it in the Bible, if you go kind of deep, it's a desire or a demand. What do you demand in your life? What do you desire in your life? Another thing is it, it talks about aiming. And I pictured in my mind looking down a rifle scope and you're aiming. What's in your aim? What's in your sights? What's your priority? What do you want? What are you aiming after? So this is what seeking is. And seeking should be our most important priority. So what's, I got three, three things I want to ask questions I want to ask you all tonight. What does it mean to seek God? Number one, what does it mean to seek God? What does it mean to de actually desire Him? Because we sing all the time about seeking God. We sing all the time. But I just, I, and if, if you know all this, man, good, I'm good for you. Because I need refresh courses here and there. All the time. So what does it mean to seek God? Number one, have an intimate, personal relationship. Look at verse 1. Right off the bat, 
very first thing David says, God, you're my God. You're my God. He knows him. He knows God. Right off the bat, he says, God, you're my God. No one else, nothing else. You are my God, my priority. Right off the bat, David knew God in an intimate way. Because there is a huge difference between knowing about a person and actually knowing that person. Huge difference. Think about like this, President Obama. All right, we know about him. We can read books about him. We can read news articles about him, about his habits and what his likes and dislikes are. We can get to know, we can know about him. But to actually know him is a lot different than that. To know him, to actually know President Obama, it would require first an introduction. Someone would have to introduce us to him. And then we would have to spend time with him, hours and hours in various situations, in different circumstances of life, to actually know him. Stay with me now, all right? Stay with me. You discover more and more as a close friend. The same thing applies to God. A lot of believers, a lot of people know about God. But do you actually know him? You may, not, you may know about him. You may know he's good, yes. And that he's always there, yes. But do you actually know him? It's the same thing. We have to be introduced to him. We were introduced to him. We were introduced to him through Jesus. Jesus came so we could get to know God, so we could be introduced to to God. Jesus introduced us to him and showed us who he is and what God's priority is. He introduced us to God. Without Jesus, we can, we can know only about God. We can't actually get to know God because it's, blood, it's through the blood of Jesus that we get to know him. We get to have an intimate relationship with him one-on-one -on -one with him. We've got, we have to turn from our sins to God and trust in Jesus and his death on our behalf, on his behalf. We have to spend time with the Father. Spend time with him. Think about your friends, your best friend, whoever it is, whoever you're closest to. Have, did you all get that way? in just a matter of time from one meeting? From one, hey, I want you to meet so-and-so. Hey. And then all of a sudden, bam, BFS, I know everything about you. Call you, I mean, you know, you're the one I call when I need help or I need some advice, whatever. No. You spent time with them. You talked with them. You had, you were close with them. You talked with them in the highs and in the lows various situations in life. It's the same thing with God. To know Him, to seek Him, we have to spend time with Him. Days, months, years, it, just for eternity. Eternity. In all areas of our life, whatever is going on, seek after Him. Have an intimate relationship with Him. Second is we always desire more of him. Always desire more of him. What does it mean to seek God? That you always desire more of him. Look at the second part of verse 1. I can't get enough of you. I'm sorry, I didn't say that. I can't get enough of you. Is what David says. I've worked up such hunger and thirst for God traveling across dry and weary deserts. He's always desiring more of Him. 
more. This is David, the man after God's own heart. I mean, if there's one dude that could be like, all right, I'm at a place, I'm good. This is the guy. But no. This is what sets him apart. I can't get enough of you. I need more of you. He already had God. He already had him. But he wanted to go deeper with him. If you look at verse 5 real quick, I want to point something out. Verse 5, it says, I eat my fill of prime rib and gravy. I smack my lips. It's time to shout praises. Here's the thing. I love it. I love the message, man. It's so cool. I love it. You ain't getting that from King Jimmy. There ain't no way. But the thing is that he always desired more of him. But right here, he's satisfied. He shows and says that I'm satisfied. I have everything I need. But I want more. I want more. That's what he's saying. How many of us today get to a place where we feel like, man, we're, we're there. Oh, I'm, I'm the closest I've ever been with God. I'm just going to kick it in neutral for a little bit. Not this guy, man. He wanted more and more of God. He always desired more of him. His whole being craved God as a thirsty man in the desert for water. He's like a guy, a man walking in the desert, about to die of dehydration, craving water. I need water. He craves God that much. That much. The phrase, I love this, the phrase, I can't get enough of you, if you look at the translation, it's talking about wild donkeys eagerly desiring food. Wild donkeys looking eagerly for food. That's what it's translated. Because it always translates as a picture. I love it. Wild donkeys looking eagerly for food. Are you all eagerly looking for God? Are you eagerly desiring, aiming for, demanding more of God? Complacency is a deadly, deadly foe. You will never reach a level of maturity where you can coast. Never, ever in your life will you be exalted so high that you will be able to coast it out and just kick it in neutral. This is where my feet, man, just were hurting right here. Even, I don't want to get ahead of myself. David was a man after God's own heart. He thirsted for more, even after years of seeking God. He thirsted, always desired more. So what does the person look like who seeks after God? First, we talked about what does it mean to seek God. You have an intimate, personal relationship, and you always desire more of him. Second, what does the person look like who seeks after God? We'll stay right here in verse 5. I eat my fill of prime rib and gravy. I smack my lips, and it's time to shout praises. Inner satisfaction. Everything going on in David's life right now, he was able, he was satisfied. He did not fall apart emotionally, physically, spiritually. He was satisfied because he sought after God. His priority was seeking after the one. How many of us would fall apart Someone talks bad about us, we fall apart. Oh. I've been there too, all right? So don't. How many of us just go nuts? Someone does, wrong, some, someone does us wrong, we just, oh, we just want to go nuts. We fall apart. Man, not him. He's lost everything. Physically, earthly, and he still says, I eat my fill. I get, I'm satisfied. It's time to shout. <laughs> Come on. Man. 
He has inner peace and calm. When you seek after God, when you are going after Him and desiring and demanding of God, you just sense you have an inner peace and calm about you. Nothing can break you in this world. Nothing can break you. Something personal that proves this point is my wife and I have been through three, I mean, man, yeah, three miscarriages now. Three miscarriages, four kids we've lost. Someone that, man, did not have, did not seek after God, did not have God in their life, God was not their priority, they just fall apart. They would just fall apart. But Stacy and I have that inner calm and peace about us. Because I know who I serve. I know about Him. I know Him. I know more than just about Him. I know Him. We know Him. And because of that, here I am, baby. We still standing. Let's go. Let's go. Anyone else? Even probably even believers, man. I know that something happens. Why is God doing this to me? What did, why does God hate me? No, 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 no. They fall apart because they don't actually know Him. That's the thing. That's the difference. Their priorities are just mixed up. David here, it's like eating, having an inner satisfaction. What does the person look like who seeks after God? They look like someone that's eating a delicious meal. David was spiritually satisfied after feasting on God. He just feast and feast and feast. Because the thing, the cool thing about it is kingdom, you eat more, you want more. You want more and more and more. Give me some more. I want more. You get just a little taste. Just a little taste. A little appetizer, baby. Bring on the 30-ouncer. Bring me that 30-ounce steak right now. That's the cool thing about this. That is so cool. So he, was, he had inner satisfaction. Look in verse 7. We're going to look at 7 and 11. <clears throat> what does the person look like who seeks after God? who their number one priority is going after God. Verse 7 says this, Because you've always stood up for me, I'm free to run and play. I'm free to run and play. Verse 11, But the king is glad in God, his true friends spread the joy. The king is glad in God. What does the person look like whose number one priority is going after God? Inner joy. His joy was not based on his circumstances. Because if that's the case, he'd be in a little corner in the desert, just crawled up with a little white flag. No more, no more, no more, I quit. Life can pressure you, you all have pressures when you all in school, the pressure of grades, pressure of whatever your parents are putting on you, your friends are putting on you. There's so much pressure on you all. But seek after God. Make that your number one priority. And look what it says in verse 7 again, that you are free to run and play. Nothing's going to break you. Nothing's going to touch you. Nothing. It's free reign, baby. Free reign. Let's go. Let's go. Inner joy. His entire world was falling apart. But he had God and God's loyal love. God is loyal to you. Loyal to you. He is madly in love with you. But the only way you're going to know that is seeking after Him. Because you go out there and listen to people talk, you're going to hear and you're going to think that God is an angry God 
who wants justice on you, that wants vengeance on you, that every time you sin, something bad's going to happen to you. That's what you're going to hear. That is not far from the truth. Get to know Him. Seek Him. And get this inner joy in you. And this time, he had his joy. He was singing, dancing, rejoicing. I mean, you can't explain that apart from God. That's just a wild man, right? Man, someone in the, out there sees us, sees what's going on in our life. Like my family, I'll give you a prime example. When all this miscarriages was happening and stuff, not one time where we crawled up waving our little white flag. And my family, bless their hearts, I love them to death. Love them, love them, love them. They kept that, I mean, you know, you know, it's all right. They asked, you know, kept asking us, what? What's what's up? You know, because here we are still singing and dancing, rejoicing. God is good. He is great. My God is a God of life. Not one time did we give the enemy any credit or any any mention, not one time. Not one time. You can't explain that apart from God. So what does the person look like who seeks after God? Look at verse 8. I hold on to you for dear life, and you hold me steady as a post, you seek after God, someone that has, that is seeking, that has the priority of seeking, demanding, aiming at God, has inner stability and strength. God was David's help. He hid under God's wing, like a little baby chicken hides under his mommy for protection. Listen, there ain't nothing wrong with needing protection. I was always brought up, I was always the guy that was the big, strong, I can do everything by myself, don't need anyone's help, you know, that type of macho man. I mean, that was such garbage. That was such garbage. Not need, Even in school, guys, I never, I felt like if I asked the teacher a question that showed weakness, don't believe that baloney. There's nothing wrong needing help, needing someone. I need him. It took a long time for me to realize that. Don't make the same mistake as I did. Need him. You need his help, his protection, his provision, his love. You need all of it. All of it. All of it. You will also have inner outlook and balance. Look at uh, verse 9. You will have inner outlook and balance. Verse 9, those who are out to get me are marked for doomed, marked for death, bound for hell. In verse 11, they're at the, kind of halfway through near the end, while small-minded gossips are gagged for good. You have an outlook and a balance. Listen, David wasn't consumed with getting even. He wasn't consumed with getting back at his son, at everything his son drove him out, drove him out of the palace, was trying to kill him. He wasn't consumed at getting back with him. Someone comes against us, talks bad about us, whatever the case is, does something that we don't like. Naturally, first thing we go to is how am I going to get them? How am I going to get them back? But David wasn't consumed. He realized God is just. And this right here, just realizing that this is not my fight. I serve a God that's there to protect me. I serve Jehovah Jireh, who will provide everything that I need. I just focus on Him and Him alone. When you realize this, this allows Him and allows you to commit the entire situation to God and act with the right outlook and balance. He made it his business to rejoice in God. Let God deal with everything else. Let God deal with the pressures. The things coming on you, 
Like Matthew 6.34 says, whatever tomorrow is, God's going to take care of it. Focus on right now. Priority is seeking God right now. The rest of it says God will take care of it when that time comes. Whatever's pressuring, whatever pressure is on you right now in your life, whatever is trying to distract you from God, don't give it any attention. Focus on Him. Go after Him. Give Him the attention. It's kind of like <laughs> it's kind of like right now with Taylor and Isaac. There's a lot of things that uh, Taylor wants to be just like him. Everything he does, everything he says, you know, she's wanting to do the exact same thing, and it drives him nuts. It drives him nuts. But when she's doing something that's annoying him, putting pressure on him, we tell him, just ignore her. Just ignore her, and she will stop. She will see that she's not getting any attention for what she's doing, and she will stop it. It's the same thing here. Whatever's in pressuring you in life, don't give it any attention. Pay no attention to it. Focus on God, and it's going to go away. He's going to take care of it. So have, you will have an inner outlook and balance in life. You're not going to be worried about how can I get, how can the right be done to me? How can I get justice? Because I serve the one. I serve the judge. So I don't need to worry about any of that. So let me, so third thing. How does a person seek after God? First thing we asked was, what does it mean to seek God? And then what does the person look like? Third, how does a person seek after God? Look at verse 3. How does a person seek after God? They put love for God at the center of their relationship with Him. Verse 3 says, In your generous love, I am really living at last. My lips brim praises like fountains. You put love for God at the center of your relationship with Him in your entire life. In your generous love, I am really living at last. Really living? He's really living at last right now? Right now? He's in the wilderness. He's in the desert, hiding out. Some guy, his son, his own blood is after him. And he's really living at last now? Seriously? I mean, come on. Who says that at this time in their life? Someone that their priority is, I want God. I want more. I want the most I can get out of him. That's who says that. That's who says that. God's generous love is better than life to David. Better than life. Look at verse 8. I mean, come on. Verse 8 says, I hold on to you for dear life, and you hold me steady as a post. David clings to God. God's powerful hand is under God. Listen to that. He clings to God. I cling to God. I need God. But then God's powerful hand is under him. I mean, that's a beautiful balance right there. I need you, God. I need you. I'm coming after you. And then his power is right under you for every circumstance in your life. Balance. Balance. This right here where it says, I hold on to you, is the exact same word in the Hebrew as it was used in Genesis 2.24. When it says a man cleaves or he holds to his wife. It also describes, it's the exact same word when it's talking about Ruth. Ruth's love and how she holds on to 
her mother-in-law, did not want to part from her. David doesn't want to, he gets it. He doesn't want to part from God. Are you there? Do you even care about parting with God? Or are you so infatuated with Him that you can't even bear the thought of being away from Him for one day? You can't stand the thought of not praying for one day, of not getting in your quiet time for one day. It just tears you up even thinking about it. That's having a priority of seeking after Him. But this holding on, this is its loyalty related to strong feelings of affection. I'll say that again. It's loyalty related to strong feelings of affection. Our relationship with God is just like a marriage. Just like a marriage. We have intense... Oh, sorry, I'm not used to this thing. <laughs> I get too into it. We have intense feelings of passion and lifelong commitment intertwined. Marriage. She would kill me if she was here, but that's all right. My marriage with Stacy. I have, I have a burning, intense passion for her. Always will. But I also have a lifelong commitment towards her. Two things intertwined together. Do you have a burning, intense desire, passion for God? And do you also have a lifelong commitment to Him? A couple falls in love with strong feelings. All right, that's how it. It's just it's how it starts. They don't start off with "I'm going to." I commit my life to you. Will you go out with me? That's not how it starts. All right. There's feelings involved. Hey, you're cute. Nope, sorry. <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> You look at someone and say, man, they're kind of pleasant to the eye. I'm going to ask them out. But it can't be built on feelings alone. Not. But on commitment. It's built on commitment. Your marriage, your relationship with God is built on commitment. Commitment carries you through the hard times when the feelings fade, when you can't stand the look, which has never happened, of course, with me and Stacy. Of course. <laughs> but those times when I just could not stand the oh, even look at her, my commitment to her is what put me in front of her and said, I'm sorry, whatever needed to be done. Same thing with you and God. When the hard times come, it's your commitment that's going to post you there. It's going to put your foot down and tell whatever's pressuring you in your life, mm -mm. I ain't moving off this right here. I ain't moving off this rock. Mm -mm. No way. It's got to be your priority, though. If it's not your priority, man, you might, oh, you might get swept away. You might. That's why it's so important. I want you to check up on your priorities tonight. Check them. Now, but get this. Listen to this. Commitment carries you through the hard times. But if there are never feelings of love, the marriage is in trouble. You've got to have love, though. You've got to have those feelings, those passionate feelings, too. Or your marriage is in trouble. Do you love have a passionate love for God. Yes, you could have given your life to, to Jesus, given your heart to Jesus. You made your commitment. But is your love still there? Is your passion still there? That passion that drives you into your quiet time, to your time of prayer, and just sitting with the Father in His presence. Is your love there? That you're so excited, you're giddy like a boy, a little kid. I can't, because oh, you know when your time is to get in front of him, and you just look at your watch and say, "Oh, it's almost there." You probably think I'm weird, all right? But you got to be at this point in your life. You got to, oh, you got to be like this, so excited. 
Because I know when, this is going to sound awful, but my time is when the kids and Stacy goes to bed, because Stacy goes to bed way, way early. All right? She's in bed by like 8.30. Good for her. She's got to get up at 5. But when they go to bed, oh, it's on. That's my time. That's my time. And so there's been some times I'm just like, oh, it's almost here. Oh, oh. 8.15. <laughs> Babe, are you a little tired right now? You want to go to bed right now? You go to bed early if you want. Because I know that's my time with the Father. So your love for God has to be at the center of your relationship with Him. Seeking after God equals keeping your passion alive. Keeping your passion for God alive. When you seek Him, your passion's going to stay alive. This could mean saying no to some things in order to say yes to your marriage. Well, again, my toes, man, were just killing me right here. All right? There's things in your life that may not seem like a pressure, but when you start saying no to it, then it starts pressuring you. Hey, 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 what about me? What about me? I had to say no to some things in my life. I had to say no because I needed to say yes to him. That was pressuring, taking time away from him. Spending consistent time time alone with him. How does a person seek after God? By spending consistent time alone. I know you all have heard this before. All right, I know it. I know it. But man, just focus right now on the now. Listen to it like you've never heard it before. Get that excitement, get that passion built back up, stir it back up again. David was under intense pressure. Had to think about how his followers were going to get food and water. He had to think about their safety. I mean, there were so many things going on that could distract him. But he, ne he never neglected seeking after God. Listen to these words as you read through Psalm 63. I can't get enough of you. My lips brim praises like fountains. I bless you every time I take a breath. My arms are like wave like banners of praise to you. I mean, does that sound like someone that knows their priorities? It does to me. He knows what he wants. He knows what he's going after. He made a, a priority to spend time alone with God. We all make time to do what we really want to do. It's just reality. What we like, what we want to do, we're going to make time for that. We're going to find time for that. No ifs, ands, or buts. It's just how it is. It's just how it is. So think of it yourself. How much of that time do you have, do you give to God? If you love God, you'll make time to spend with Him. I know. I know. I love you all. I'm talking to me too, all right? How much time do you spend with him? He's not asking for 24 hours a day, okay? He's, our God, he's understanding. I love him. He's awesome. He understands. He understands we have responsibilities. But it's the sacrifice, man. It's the sacrifice that he's like, yeah, I see that. I see that. Yeah, I see it made it, David made it a priority to spend time alone with God. He made it a priority with all chaos going on. He still made time. He still made time to spend alone with everything going on, man. And we have what going on in our lives, and we struggle. We come up with excuses of why we don't spend time with him, why we don't spend enough time, ample time with him. We didn't ha even have close to this going on or what they have going on overseas. I mean, they got people coming after them. And want... <sighs> Come on. We ain't got those problems here. So what's our excuse? What's our excuse? 
And last, incorporating him into every area of your life. Listen, God isn't just a slice of life. He's not just some little part. He's just a part of my life. He saturates every area of my life. Saturates it. Like a little pie chart. You got a little cut. Uh, he is the pie chart. He is my chart. He saturates every area of my life. No area of your life where God is not in an essential part. Every part of your life, God has to be, needs to be, and better be the essential part of that. Whatever, school, home, friend, whatever it is. Sport, whatever. He's the essential part. He is the part that saturates it. David's life, his kingdom's in trouble, running for his life, seeking protection for his men. But he understands if God were temporarily squeezed. Think about this. Everything going on. The human side of me, okay, I would understand it if at this point in David's life, he, okay, he said, you know what? I got a lot going on, God. I'm sorry. Kind of got my hands full right now. I really can't seek out. I can't really spend time with you right now. To me personally, I would understand that. All right? Me personally, okay, running for your life. You got someone after you who wants to kill you. You're away from your house. You have no idea where you're going to sleep. You have no idea what's going to happen. Okay. I, I give you a, a hall pass on this one. But not him. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Not him. The King James Version says that he was following hard after God. Following hard. Not just following. Everything I've got, I'm giving it to him. Man, that's why I can't, I can't wait to meet the, I can't wait to oh, worship with him. I can't wait. God was the center of David's present and future. So let me ask you, is, is God the center of your present right now? And is he the center of your future? So let me ask you this. I don't know why, I'm just, whenever I'm done. How is it with you and God? How is it with you? Am I able to have a little music? Is that... A, I mean, who, if Bobby just wants to do guitar, that's fine, or whatever. How is it with you and God? I'm serving Him. I'm actively serving Him. I'm in church. I go to church all the, every single service. I come to crave worship. <laughs> Yay for me. I serve in the church. No, no, no. That's not what I asked. That's not what I asked. Because you can be serving. You can, you can look the part. You can be here and be sitting there. But your mind can be somewhere else right now thinking, good gracious, when's this guy going to be quiet? <laughs> but how is it with you and God? Your all's relationship. How is it? I want you to do this. Think back to this last week, especially you kids with having no school all week. <laughs> your last week, your last month, and just think about, ask yourself this question. Did my schedule reflect that seeking God was my number one priority? Was it your number one priority? In the last month, last week, two weeks, whatever, since 2015? Because we all make resolutions, you know, 
we're all raw, raw the first couple weeks, and then we get back into our normal self. Is seeking God your number one priority right now in your life? Or are you consumed and worried about all the pressures of life right now? Well, that's my priority, but I've been under a lot of pressure. Pressure is what reveals your true priorities. It reveals your true priorities. When the pressure is on, everything but essential gets set aside. When the pressure is on, the squeeze is on, only the things that really matter stay in put. Everything else gets pushed aside. Tonight, Holy Spirit is telling us that seeking God is essential. It's essential. So guys, tonight I just I wanted to just encourage you. I beseech you to seek after God and make it number one. Number one. Number one. I mean, think about everything that God has done for you. That's the least we can do for Him. Is just make it number one to go after Him. It's not hard. I mean, if you just listen to the list I just read you, it's not hard. It's not this huge grand scheme that only the smartest of the smarts can figure out. Just people like us in good old Buffalo, West Virginia. Man, we have the key. We have the key. We have the answer. It's just up to you now. I, if you never heard it before, I presented you the answer right there to seeking after God. So no more excuses. Let's go after Him. Oh, let's go after Him. And if you've been going after Him, man, go after Him some more. Go get you some more. Go get some more. Don't stand around and be like, yep, I'm good. I'm, oh yeah, I'm there. No, go get more. Go get you some more. Thank you for listening to this message. For more information, please visit us at faithchristianfellowship.com.